Y'all just follow me. Can you see the land? Can you see the land? The mighty one, the holy one, reigning on this land. Can you see the land? Can you see the land? The mighty one, the mighty one, the Lift up your voice. I can see the land, the mighty one, the mighty one, the holy one, reigning all this land. Can you see the land? <laughs> can you see the land? The mighty one, the And his train fills the temple. I see the dry and thirsty land, longing for the reign of the Lord. Thirsting and dry and parched and cracked and dry, thirsting for the reign of the Lord. And I see the mighty one rising with healing at his wings. Come on. Can you see the land? Lift up your voice. Can you see the land? Oh, the mighty one, the holy one, reigning on this land. Let your rain fall on this land. Let your rain fall on this land. Let your fall on this land let your rain fall on this land sing let your rain fall on this land let it fall Lord rain fall on this land Ooh. Ooh. Let your rain 
Let's sing one chorus before we're seated for the word. the Lord to breathe on you. You may be seated. Just take your Bibles. I'm not going to really take a lot of time with this particular scripture, but it was on my heart this morning. I want you to go to 2 Samuel chapter number 5. 2 Samuel chapter number 5. And we'll look in verse 24. Hand me that hand, Hill, just to be safe. Second Samuel <clears throat> chapter 5 and verse 24. Let's try this one here, Benny, and just see what it does. We've got a bad deal here. Test. 
test, test, test. That's good. <clears throat> I want to just point out one verse here today. I think that uh, this morning whenever I got up, the Lord gave me this verse of Scripture just ringing over and over in my head, and I think I want to talk about it just for a minute as a side to what I'm going to bring to you. The Lord told David, <clears throat> he said, Let it be when you hear the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees that then thou shalt bestir thyself. For then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. Look at verse 24 one more time. And it shall be when you hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, then thou shalt bestir thyself. Today I want to take just a little while. In just a moment, uh, Steve is going to come and he's going to share with you. We're going to split the time this morning, but I want to share with you for just a little while about revival. Like I told you last night, none of us here are experts on revival. We, we know a little bit, and what little bit we do know and have learned, we think we've learned, we want to share with you. How many of you, once again, are here for the very first time? Can I see your hand, please? You're here for the very first time, okay? <clears throat> the Lord said to David, he said, when you hear the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, he said, it's time to bestir yourself. Stir yourself up. You see, there was a time. God told David, he said, there is a time, there's a set time here that I've got. You're going to go out to battle. And he said, don't go to battle just any time you want to go to battle. But he said, whenever you see and you hear, be still, be quiet, look up there. And whenever you see the angels or the wind, whatever it was, shaking the tops of those mulberry trees, he said, that's a sign to you. Don't go to battle until then, but whenever you see the mulberry trees stirred, it's time for you to stir yourself. It's time to go to battle. It's time to go. And now in America is a ripe time. God is beginning to send revival, and it's not time for us to be on the sidelines judging revival. It's time for us to stir ourselves. And friend, I'm going to tell you, God is dealing with us. He's pouring out His Spirit. We've been praying for this. We've been wanting this. <clears throat> and now that God is beginning to do it, why in the world is a lot of the church world on the sidelines picking at it and judging it? We're Pentecostal people. We were born in the fire. Come on, friend. We're born in the fire. And uh, for God now to begin to send His Spirit, and, and there's a stirring in the land, and there's a stirring in America, and there's a stirring in our churches, all denominations of our churches, it's time for us in the ministry to begin to bestir ourselves. God will meet us if we'll see the signs of the times. And that's what God is doing. But as surely as God begins to move, I want you to know there's going to be about five things I want to talk to you about quickly this morning that you're going to have to face in your life, in your ministry, and in your church. I want you to get prepared for them. And uh, friend, listen, instead of taking notes, I have these in the back of my book, Feast of Fire. If you already have a copy, that's fine. You look at them back there. If you don't and you're planning on getting a copy, they're back there anyway. So I don't, I'd hate to lose you and get you distracted by making notes. But I want to just share five things with you real quick that you're going to face whenever God begins to send revival. As I look outside this morning, and I see all those people lined up out there, and that's a very few because they know this week we're in a pastor's conference. But did you know in the mornings whenever our secretary pulls up to unlock the office and to open up early in the morning, did you know that there's already outside around 1,000, 1,500 people? And by the time the service starts, there's usually around, say, 1,500, anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 people outside. They go to Kmart. They buy tarps that they stretched. We used to have palm trees out there. We had to take them down because uh, the, <laughs> the ground was getting so packed where all those hundreds of people have stood for so long that the trees couldn't get water anymore. And so we took them all out, and we had to put down concrete all the way down that boulevard. And uh, people go out there, and they go to Kmart's, and they buy these little tarps, the little blue tarps that you can get there, and the little green ones. And did you look out there as you pass by the road? It's like a huge caterpillar winding its way down on the outside out there. And there's people camped out. They stay out there in the wind, the rain, the cold, the hot. 
I've never in my life seen such hunger as there is today in America. And people are wanting, friend, people are wanting a touch of God in their life. People are desperate. You see, the reason why God's doing things in people's lives today the way that He is is because people have become desperate. They want a touch of God. And there's, there's things that said about revivals, always has been and there always will be. But I want to share something with you this morning. You might be looking at me and you might be thinking, well, Brother Kilpatrick, do you know what's being said out there in the country about this revival? Well, basically, it's, it's, it's good talk about the revival. We know that. And I tell you why it's good talk is because of the souls. We're going after souls. And this is one of those revivals to where it's not like, uh, you know, there's powerful manifestation there and we have some souls are being saved. This is, there's over 100,000 souls have been saved. And by the way, there's a few manifestations along the rhyme. So this is not about signs and wonders. This is about souls. We're going after God. We're going after souls. That's what this is all about. And so uh, people may wonder, well, Brother Kilpatrick, do you know what's being said out there in the country about uh, the revival there at, uh, at the church you pastor? And I know that it's basically good talk, but I know there's some negative talk also. But you might say, well, doesn't that bother you? And I want to tell you, friend, I want you to look at me straight in the eye. It does not bother me one iota. Not one. I don't care if they do take a picture of me laying up there on my chair out under the glory and they put it with some other film that they've taken from other places, walking dogs around on leashes and all that stuff, you know. That don't bother me if they put me on there with that stuff. Matter of fact, it's really a compliment because if this wasn't a God, the devil wouldn't be fighting it like that. But it doesn't bother me at all, and I'll tell you why. Because I know in my heart that what happened here on Father's Day and what's still happening is of God. Let the dogs bark, the caravan moves on, friend. Amen? Let them bark, let them carry on, let the, let the heathen rage. This is a move of God. And I don't care what anybody says about it. I love you, friend, and I'm glad you're here, but I really don't care what you think about it. You may stay here for the next two or three days, and you may sit out there and judge every little thing that's going on. You may even have a little video camera in your pocket where you're taking pictures of everything that's said and done here. Go ahead. It really doesn't bother me because I know that God is in this place. If I didn't know that and if I knew that this was a fake and it was all fabricated and worked up, I'd be nervous, I'd be concerned about my ministry, and I'd be concerned about the church that I pastor. But I have not one concern. I don't lose a bit of sleep when I go home at night. Matter of fact, I cherish every bit of the sleep I can rake and scrape. <laughs> but uh, I, I know that this is the Lord. But whenever revival comes to your church, I want to tell you, I, well, let me ask, ask this question. How many of you are experiencing revival already? Uh, hold your hands up. Man, look at that. It probably... Probably at least a half or three quarters. How many of you are not experiencing revival yet, but you really want it? Let me see your hand. I would say that there's probably more people here that's experiencing the move of God than those maybe that's not yet experiencing the move of God. But those of you that just raised your hand that you want to move of God, but you're not experiencing it yet, hang on. It's coming your way, friend. Hang on. Glory. The wind is blowing. For so long in our churches, what we had, we talked about revival, we preached about revival, and we'd come to church and we'd have some lightning, we'd have some thunder cracking, we'd have some dark clouds, but people would leave out and there's no rain. Well, I'm here to tell you it's beginning to rain. It's beginning to rain of the power of God's Spirit. But there's about five things that I want to talk to you about real quickly this morning that you're going to experience whenever revival comes to your church. And here again, it's just a matter of, a matter of time until it does come. The first thing I want to talk to you about is doubt. Those of you that are ministers and your spouses and you're concerned about the church that you pastor, I, wa I want you to notice that I keep saying the church that I pastor. Sometime we have this uh, thing that we say, my church, you know, uh, my church. I don't even call Brownsville my church. Matter of fact, when I've been praying for a number of years now, even in prayer, as I would pray about Brownsville, I would always say to the Lord, Lord, the church that you've given me to, to pastor. I'm the under-shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. And this is not my church. And I want to tell you something about your church. It's not your church either. And they're God's people. They're not your people. They're God's people. We don't own them. That pulpit right there, when I have my meetings every year, the first of the year, I talk to all my workers and the department heads and I tell them, I say, look, that lectern that you minister behind on Sunday mornings is not yours. 
The scotch tape you use is not yours. The scissors that you use is not yours. The, the construction paper that you use is not yours. The desk that you have is not yours. That pulpit right there is not mine. I remember before revival broke out, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I was in my backyard. I could take you right to the spot in my backyard where the Lord spoke to me before revival broke out. And he said this, and I thought it was so sweet the way the Lord said it. He said, may I, may I send someone in to the church there. And he was telling me that I was going to have to take a backward place for a while. He told me that he was going to begin to move mightily. But he asked me, may I do so and so? And the first thought that hit my mind was I was going to be sick. I thought maybe I was going to be debilitated in some way and I wasn't going to be able to pastor anymore and God was going to send somebody in and I would have to serve for a while like maybe a pastor emeritus. But it didn't work out like that at all. Whenever God called me to preach at the age of 14, he told me several things whenever he called me to preach that day that he was going to do in my ministry. Up until Father's Day of 1995, there was a couple of things that took place uh, that the Lord was doing in, in our ministry. And he told me that when I was 14 in biology class when he called me to preach. But a couple of the other major things had never happened, and I thought in my heart that somehow I'd failed God. And I thought I'd missed the Lord somewhere down the line. And I was grieving about it, really, because I felt like, you know, getting on up in age, I'm in my middle 40s. Go ahead, I want you, I wanted you to laugh. I'm in my middle 40s, and uh, I'm getting old. My wife is getting old. Uh, we're getting old. We're grandparents already. And so I began to think to myself, well, Lord, I've missed you somewhere. But uh, whenever it broke out on Father's Day, the way Steve came in and God used him here as the evangelist, and I'm still preaching on Sundays, of course, to our people, still pastoring the church and pastoring the revival, but uh, some of the other things that the Lord spoke to me back when I was 14 years old has just now begun to come to reality. And I wanted to tell you something, friend. Pastors, listen to me. Ministers, don't get in a hurry. Whenever, if God told you, it will happen. Faithful is he that calleth thee, and he will do it. So don't be concerned about it. Whenever revival begins to break forth in your church, one of the main things you're going to have to deal with, first of all, is doubt. Doubt. Now, I want to talk to you for a few minutes this morning about doubt. Doubt seems to be a real powerful word, but I don't really look at doubt as that powerful of a word. I look at it really more as a positive word than I do a negative. Let me show you what I'm talking about. You see, whenever God begins to break forth in your church, you may think you know your church, but you really don't know it. You know, you may brag to your friends, oh, I know my people, bless God. <laughs> you know, I know my people, bless God. They, they're going to do so-and-so and so-and-so. You better just watch out what you say because it'll make a fool out of you, brother, especially when revival comes. Some of the very people that you think will get in won't, and some of the very ones you think won't get in will jump right in that river. That's just the way it works. Revival is full of surprises, and I want to say that again. Revival is full of surprises. But one of the first things you'll have to deal with is doubt, and I want to talk to you about that word doubt just for a little bit. You see, doubt is different than unbelief. Look this way, everybody. Doubt can be pastored. Doubt means you come to a stop sign and you don't really know which way to go. It means you don't know how to proceed. It means you've come to a stop sign, an intersection, but you look straight ahead and you say, mm, I don't know. And you look to the left, well, I'm not sure. You look to the right, well, that seems okay, but I'm just not really sure. They need a map. When a person's in doubt, they need guidance. And whenever revival breaks out in your church, I'll tell you, one of the first things you're going to deal with from even good people will be doubt. And don't get mad at people in your church if they have some doubts. Pastor those doubts. Love those people and pastor those doubts. Avail yourself to answer questions. I got so tired of answering questions about revival. That's the reason I wrote that book, Feast of Fire, the first book I wrote. 
Steve kept on at me, and he said, Pastor, write a book about it. Write a book about it. So I got to where I'd go home at night. We'd get home about 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. I'd go home at 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, the only break that I would have, and work on that book from 1 o'clock, 2, 3, 4, 5 o'clock some mornings. And that's when I wrote the book because while it was fresh on my heart and while all these questions were being asked and my head was in that environment of all those questions, that's the way that I wrote that book about Feast of Fire. And one of the things that you're going to face in your congregation whenever God begins to move mightily is you're going to have to face that situation of doubt in the congregation. And let me show you how Jesus dealt with doubt. You remember Thomas. Jesus didn't upbraid Thomas and scold Thomas. Thomas was there and and he said, you know, before, uh, he, he missed it, you remember, and missed the appearing of the Lord. And then he looked at the Lord and, and he said, Lord, I just, I'm having trouble believing and except I can touch that, except I can move toward the reality of that and put my hand there, I don't think I'm going to be able to believe. You know what Jesus did? He said, have at it, son. He pulled his robe open. He said, go ahead. And there was a fresh gash in there where that spear went up. And Jesus held his hands out. He said, take your time. Touch him. Here. Touch him. And then he said this. He said, blessed are they that have not seen and have not had this opportunity that you have to touch these scars. Blessed are they that have not had this opportunity, but still believe. So doubt is something that can be pastored, and whenever people have doubts, don't get upset with them, and don't be mean with them, and drive them off because they have some legitimate doubts. See, people come from all different backgrounds in our churches. It used to be years ago that you, a Pentecostal church was made up of Pentecostal people. A Baptist church was made up of Baptist people. It's not that way anymore. Today, our congregations are hodgepodge. They are a mixture of people from all walks of life, all races, and all denominational backgrounds. And so whenever God breaks forth and does something strange like this that a congregation is not used to and is out of the ordinary, there's going to be some good people in your church that used to be Southern Baptist or used to be United Methodist or used to be Catholic or maybe even Pentecostal, and they never saw anything like that, and they're going to have some doubts. So one of the first things you're going to have to do, Pastor, is take some time and pastor that doubt. Now the next thing I want to talk to you about is distractions. After revival first broke out here at Brownsville, the devil's chief responsibility, one of his chiefest responsibilities as being a devil is to distract God's people. How many of you have ever made up your mind that you're going to, go, you're going to fast? And, uh, you know, you tell your wife, honey, now the first of the month, I'm going to be seeking God. And uh, I'm going to be fasting. <laughs> Brother, the devil comes while you're asleep and sharpens your taste buds and your nostrils. <laughs> he sticks something up your nose. And you, you, can smell, you can smell bread cooking four miles away. Oh, my God, do you smell that? Well, smell what? You know. It's a distraction, you know, it's a distraction. And you, you make up your mind, well, today I'm going to go in at 1.15 and I'm going to pray for an hour. Before 1.15 comes, the devil does everything he can to distract you from that prayer closet. Whenever revival comes to your church, expect distractions. Number one, there's going to be doubts. You've got to pastor it. You're going to have to take time with it. You're going to have to love these people. Take time with it. The second thing is you're going to have to face distractions. Now, some of the things that we face was people got distracted by different things. There's good distractions, and then there's negative or bad distractions. Some of the normal distractions was that people, they came every night, because see, this broke out in June. They came every night during the summer, and the power of God was so awesome. Many, many times, Steve and I left here in the mornings as the sun was coming up. By 5 o'clock, we'd be leaving out of the church going home. We'd been here from 7 o'clock until about 5 o'clock in the morning. Many nights during the summer. Because the power of God was just so awesome to move in here. was just It was awesome. And it still is awesome. But we have to regulate and temper our bodies to get enough rest that we can keep functioning. So we usually leave every night about between 12 and 1 o'clock. It's when we leave every night now and go home. 
Like last night, many of you was here till 12 o'clock and you thought you had done something. Friend, we're here every night till 12 o'clock like that. And, uh, you know, it, it'll be a wear and tear on your body. You can get distracted with that. And there will be some distractions that the devil will use on your congregation when revival breaks out that will be good distractions and legitimate things, but people can start going after those things and get distracted from a move of God. And I've often said that this revival is just like a combine in the fields at night with the headlights on. That's exactly what this revival is like. It's just like cracking, cranking up a tractor as the sun's going down and letting that tractor go out in the fields at night with combines and getting in the harvest with the headlights on at night. That's what this revival is all about. We're still getting in the souls. It's getting dark. The dispensation of grace is coming to a close. The dispensation of tribulation is looming right over the horizon. It's coming at us. The rapture could take place any moment, but we're out there getting in the souls. This church is going to be like a prototype that God is going to use, and there's going to be other churches just like this one all over the nation where they're going to be having services four or five nights a week getting in the harvest. But you can't be lazy. You cannot be lazy. You can't hope to come in here next Sunday or next Wednesday and have revival, have a major move of God on Sunday and say, Lord, we'll see you Wednesday night. If God breaks out, keep going and just see what the Lord will do. God can strengthen your church and God can strengthen that staff, but don't expect the Lord to show up with the same intensity and the same environment and the same power the next week. If God breaks out in a major way, go for it. So as soon as revival broke out here at Brownsville, we had some major distractions. Like they said last night, we had two hurricanes. The first one that came through uprooted trees. It tore shingles off of roofs. It, it did a good bit of damage. That was Hurricane Aaron. And uh, right after that, all the meteorologists were talking. The Weather Channel was talking. They said there hasn't been a direct hit in Pensacola for 60-something years, almost 70 years. But just a couple of months after that, there was another hurricane came in. It was name was Opal. And it crossed paths of the other hurricane that came in just a couple of months before. They crossed paths right out there in the Gulf, and both of them hit Pensacola. Now, what's the odds of that happening? I heard them discuss it on the Weather Channel. What's the odds of that happening? Well, we was in a major revival here, and the odds was the devil didn't like this revival. And the devil has tried other things. Uh, Steve's secretaries, their house burned down while they were still in Texas before they came here to Pensacola. My father-in-law, Brenda's dad, is 79 years old. He went to Sears in Chattanooga. Up there at Sears, had some tires put on his car. And while he was putting the papers, after he had the tires put on his car, he was putting the papers in the trunk of his car out there in the parking lot. And some guy come up to him all addled and out of his mind and put a gun right to the back of his neck and shot him right in the back of his neck. And I want you to know that bullet went in the back of his neck, put it right up to his spine and shot that bullet went in his neck, missed everything, missed all the arteries, missed his spine and everything, came out the side of his face and did no damage whatsoever. And the doctor said, it's a miracle. <laughs> friend, listen, if God be for us, who can be against us? And I want to tell you this, friend, go after God. If there's a stirring in the mulberry trees, don't stand around and say, Lord, what's going on? Get in there and let God pour out his spirit and God will anoint you with unusual supernatural strength. If there's a stirring in the mulberry trees, friend, bestir yourself. Bestir your church. Sure, there's going to be skeptics, and sure, there's going to be doubters. Let me get back to doubt just for a minute. I left out something, and I want to tell you about it. I saw about doubt a while ago. You got a pastor doubt. But you know what unbelief is? I looked up the word unbelief even this morning early. And you know, I looked up that word unbelief, and in both places it said it was an incredulous person. It says, unbelief is a person that is incredulous. And I looked up the word incredulous, and it means a skeptic. Now, do you know what uh, unbelief is? Let's say my shoe was tied. In order to get my shoe like it was before I tied it, I would have to untie it. You know what unbelief is? Unbelief usually is a person that has once believed. And unbelief means to unbelieve. Did you know that our churches are full of people that once believed? Did you know that our churches are full of people that once was on fire for God, once moved in the gifts of the Spirit, once moved in the fervor and the zeal of the Holy Ghost, once believed God for miracles? Oh, pastor, nothing is impossible. 
But now you look out there in the pews, and you see many of them have had facial changes. Their countenance has changed. Their attitude has changed. They've moved from the front bench to the back bench to the balcony, and many of them out the door. You watch it, pastors in your church. They'll go from the choir to the front row to the back row to the balcony and out the back door. That's the way it works. And many of them were once on fire for God. But an unbeliever is a person that usually once believed and believed that all things were possible, but now they are in unbelief. They are undoing everything. You know what God said about Israel? It said that Israel could not enter the land of promise. Why? Because of their, say it, because of their unbelief. Did they once believe? You better believe they believed. Israel saw the Red Sea part. Israel saw the manna come down, 300 railroad boxcars a day. And they saw the quail come down. My God, what a covey of quail. All that water that came out of that rock, millions of gallons of water coming out of a rock. And they saw the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Sure, they were believers. But the Bible said they could not enter because of what? Unbelief. They talk themselves out of believing. And I want to tell you, friend, I don't want to wind up my race on this earth as an unbeliever. I want to wind up more on fire for God than I've ever been before. I want to wind up saying, Lord God, if you've ever done it once, you can do it again. And Father, I believe now more than I ever have. The Bible says Joshua and Caleb had a different spirit. They had another spirit about them. They said, give me this mountain. I don't care about the giants. I don't care about all those other things. Give me this mountain. God said, I'll make you like a threshing sledge. I'll make your head hard. I'll make your forehead harder than their forehead. And you'll beat that mountain into powder. And I'll send the wind of my spirit and blow that mountain away. Give me this mountain, they said. Shoo! Unbelief. You can pastor doubt, but friend, when you get a church that's in unbelief, watch it. The Bible said Israel could not enter because of their unbelief. Let me take just another moment here about this business of unbelief. I'm concerned about the preachers that once believed God. I'm concerned about the preachers that once had the baptism of the Holy Spirit and once moved in the miraculous, and once laid hands on people and prayed for them, and once let the gifts of the Spirit be in operation in their churches. But now, all of a sudden, it's graveyard quiet. And when we get up and preach, we give a very intellectual, deep message. But there's not even an altar call after many of the messages. Nobody in the altar, no travailing in Zion, no new birth, no travailing to push those young'uns out at the altar. And our head is coming out of the mouth of our preachers instead of their spirit. When preachers stand behind the pulpit to preach, friend, there's a big difference when your head comes out of your mouth and when your spirit comes out of your mouth. Jesus said, my words are spirit and a life. And I tell you, when you're anointed with the Holy Ghost, that spirit will come out of your mouth. And when it comes out, it'll be pregnant with fire and with miracles and with the glory and the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost. But when your head comes out of your mouth, it'll put people to sleep. It's something you got out of a book. It's something you've studied. It's something that moved you just for a little while in your intellect. It stimulated you, but quickly it died off. And many times it dies off even before you get behind the pulpit because it was intellectual. Oh, God, touch our preachers and our pulpits again with a fresh fire of the Holy Ghost. Shoo! Touch us again, Lord, with fresh fire. I don't want to wind up being an unbeliever. Unbelief, undoing. Distractions, I've already covered that. Let me go to the next one. Disappointments. This is a biggie. The devil majors in disappointments, friends. He majors and disappointments. Did you know grief 
and disappointment are first cousins? Grief and disappointment are first cousins. You know when you lose your husband in death or you lose your wife in death or you lose someone in death that you love, it's really a severe disappointment because you didn't have that time with them that you wanted to have. Or you, you didn't get to fulfill the expectancy and the dream with that person. Or you didn't get to say what you wanted to say. You didn't get to fish. You didn't get to take them where you wanted to take them. You didn't get to retire. It's a disappointment. And that disappointment can lead into grief. And grief can lead into depression and extreme, heavy, unnatural sorrow. Disappointment. One of the things that you'll have to face whenever revival breaks out is this. Many people that you love and need in your life and in your ministry, and you look up to them and you lean on them and you need to see them in the pews. When revival breaks out, they may change on you right before your very eyes. And you've leaned on them for years. You've needed them for years. You've talked with them. You would call them on the phone before you'd call anybody else to pray. Maybe you'd go out and have a meal with them. You'd have good fellowship. Maybe you fished with them. Maybe you golfed with them. But when revival breaks out, sometimes they can change before your very eyes. And if you don't watch it, disappointment will grip your heart and you'll be tempted to back off from a move of God because the devil's trying to get you in severe disappointment. Friend, I don't know about you, but I've made up my mind. Though none go with me, yet I will follow. I don't care what anybody else does. I am willing to shake off all the baggage. I'm willing to shake off all the friends if I have to. And I did shake off all my friends. We lost them all in order for a move of God. But oh, the blessings of the move of God far outweigh anything that you lose in an earthly relationship. Oh, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. Disappointment. Oh, look at what, how Jesus faced it. When he was on the cross, he looked out. There wasn't a disciple there, friend. They wasn't there. Face it. The man's emotions was on a roller coaster. Had to be. Bible says he's moved with the feeling of our infirmities in every way that we were tempted. He was tempted. He's moved by what we experienced. He felt it. He even walked out there in the garden. He said to the disciples, guys, can't you stay awake? I'm facing the biggest time of my earthly life. I need you, men. Can't you watch with me and pray? He goes off and comes back, and they're asleep again, impervious to what's happening. You may be burning on the inside with a move of God. You may be burning with thirst and hunger for God. You can't get enough. You want to hear anything. You want to read anything about a move of God. You go back home and you look at your board and they're asleep in the garden. Jesus felt it. But did he stay out there and sit on a rock somewhere and get depressed and say, that's the way you're going to be. I'm not going to go no further with this thing. <laughs> you know what he did? He turned his face like a fence and went right back in there. The Bible said, and prayed and prayed and sought the face of God. And what he was saying was, I have set the cross before me. And though none go with me, and though my disciple betray me and sell me for 30 pieces of silver, and I have poured my life in these men, I've lived under the stars with them. And if they won't go with me, Jesus, or God, I have set my face like a flint, and I'm going to finish my course. I'm going all the way. When Jesus finally got on the cross, the devil came back and slapped him on the other cheek with disappointment. Pow! He slapped him with the disciples, failing him when he needed them. And when he's hanging on the cross, pow! He slapped the other cheek. Where's your disciples, Jesus? You ever had a big function at your church and you look around for key people that you need to be there and they're not there? Jesus is hanging up there, suspended between heaven and earth, pinned. 
hurting, bleeding, dying. I believe that one of the reasons why the sky turned dark was not because God put a cloud over the sun. I believe that one of the reasons the sky turned dark is every demon in hell, every bull demon, every dog of the damned, every bull of Basham came vomiting out of the underworld. And they all focused on that man on the middle cross. The Bible said that the devil is the prince and the power of the air and the ruler of darkness. And I believe that hell was vomiting and regurgitating demons up to attack that man on the middle cross as he took on the sins of the world. Jesus wasn't just hurting, friend. He wasn't just dying. He was under severe spiritual attack, and there was nobody there. Where's your disciples, Jesus? If you're going to found the world's greatest church and you're going to build heaven off of these earthlings, where's your own disciples? And Jesus looked around and they were all scared and hiding like foxes in a hole. And I want to tell you this. Whenever revival breaks out in your church, my brother my sister, expect disappointments. Those that you need to be there with you, that you thought, you've talked about God down through the years and you thought they really had a mighty touch of God. And now God's broke out and they're gone. You can be distracted by grieving and walk out there on that platform many times. And even though God's moving, you have be so focused and preoccupied with a disappointment that God's moving and you can't get in on the move of God because you're so taken up with disappointment. Number four, discouragement. I won't take but a minute on this one. I'm, I've got to close. I love Elijah. Let me tell you about him real quick. We won't take time to turn in the scriptures, but let me just tell you about him. Here's a man had a great victory. Kill those 400 false prophets of Baal, you remember? He said, the real God answered by fire. He poured water on the sacrifice. <laughs> fire came down and consumed it. It's gone. I've said this before in regard to Elijah, but I want to talk about it again this morning real, real quick. Listen carefully. I want to talk to you for a minute about discouragement. See, I'm talking about the devil's deadly deeds. Doubt, distraction, disappointment, now discouragement. These are some big boys. Get ready, you're going to face them. <clears throat> let, me tell you, let me talk to you real quick about discouragement. After Elijah had killed those 400 false prophets of Baal, you remember what Jezebel said? Read it in your Bible. <clears throat> she said, tomorrow, about this time, your life will be as one of them. Have you ever noticed when we get discouraged how we lose touch with reality? Now, let me show you what I'm talking about. You see, if, if discouragement hits you just right, friend, you can lose touch with reality. You can get in a make-believe netherworld where you begin to drift off course. And first news you know, you way out yonder somewhere away from the convoy. She said, tomorrow. You know what tomorrow means? 24 hours from now. Your life will be as one of them. In other words, he just killed him. So she's saying within 24 hours, you'll be a dead man. You know what happened? Elijah went into the wilderness. And when he went in the wilderness, he should have been watching his watch, his clock. And said, she's got eight more hours. If I'm not dead in eight hours, I'm going after I'm going to kill her. I'm serious, friend. I'm serious. You know, if he killed 400 false prophets of Baal, what's a little more blood? <laughs> Amen. What's a little more blood? She's a woman. No, she's not. She's the devil. Amen. You know, God finally got her, and the dogs licked her blood up. Literally licked the blood up sooner or later, just licked the blood up. Amen. Come on. <laughs> Don't draw back on me now, friend. This is a major breakthrough to revival. Kill Jezebel. <laughs> it's a major breakthrough in revival. Watch what I'm telling you. She said, tomorrow, about this time, your life will be as one of them. And he should have been watching his watch. But no, he never looked at the sun, never looked at the watch. He went out there in depression, and he laid down, went to sleep. And you know what happened? He was asleep, and somebody jostled him awake. And he looked up, and it was an angel. 
Now, if I would have been in discouragement and I looked up and seen an angel, what would you have done? I said, whoo! Hey, what's your name? My name's Elijah. What's your name? This was a gleaming, powerful angel. And the angel woke him up and said, Elijah, I've been sent here by the Lord to feed you. I can see him now with a chef's hat on and an apron. <laughs> and he leaned over, and Elijah looked up at him. Here's this big angel shelf with a chef's hat on and an apron. And the angel said, I want you to eat something I've fixed for you. This is heaven's recipe because you're going to need it for your journey. So the Bible said Elijah got up and ate it, drank the cruise of water, went back to sleep, and it woke him up again. And this time, instead of Elijah looking at his watch and saying, well, my God, it's been 24 hours. I'm not dead. That lying fool, I'm going after her. The reason I say fool is she wasn't considering God. He should have turned around right then instead of going deeper in that wilderness, friend, deeper in that discouragement, he should have flipped around his heel and went in and took his sword and went right up to Ahab if he got in his way and cut his head off and cut Jezebel's head off too. Elijah could have been used mightily by God, but I want to show you what happened. He went deeper in the wilderness, and he goes 10 days, 12 days, 16 days, and he's not even thinking, oh, you know, an angel woke me up, an angel cooked for me, I've ate some angel food, I'm not even hungry. I'm not even thirsty. It's 16 days. Hey, it's 24 days. Hey, it's, it's 37 days. I'm still not hungry. I'm not even thirsty. Wow, man. Whew. He didn't even think like that. See, when you get in discouragement, you don't even think reality. You're consumed with your problem. Well, he got down there, and the Lord come to him this time. Now, listen, friend, first, it was an angel. Second, 24 hours expired. Nothing happened like she said it was going to happen. That should have encouraged him. Don't you think that should have encouraged him? That should have encouraged him. Well, he gets down there, and now God says, Elijah, what you doing here? And he comes out with, Lord, man, if God would have spoke to me, I couldn't have said those things, could you? Lord, I'm the only one left. Everybody else has done all this, that, and the other, and I'm the only one left. The Lord said, I tell you what, you stand right here, son. Come up here, I got a place for you. I want to stand you out here on this little platform. Stood him up there on the platform, and the Bible says God sent a wind so strong that it busted rock. Now, friend, I live in Florida, and I've seen some hurricanes, but I ain't never seen no hurricane bust rocks. It didn't say an earthquake busted the rocks. It said a strong wind busted the rocks. Can't you imagine the whistle on that wind? It busted rocks, and God was giving him a pyro, gyro, something, another. And he was looking around, and he said, wow. And then all of a sudden, God sent an earthquake, and God sent the earthquake to shake the man up. Shake him. Have you ever had somebody need to grab hold of your shoulders and shake you real good? God was shaking the earth and shaking Elijah real good and said, Hey, wake up. You're discouraged. And then the Bible said God sent a fire. You know, whenever you're cold and discouraged and fearful, you're cold. Well, God sent a fire and warmed him up. Put a blanket over him, so to speak. Said, I won't warm you up, son. And then the Bible said that God spoke to him with a still small voice, and that still small voice means this, Elijah, baby, come here. Come here, Elijah. A still small voice means he spoke to him sweetly and softly. Whenever you're in discouragement, friend, you don't need somebody to say, Elijah, you know. You need somebody to say, Elijah, come here, baby. But you know what happened? Watch this now. I want to just show you the picture. He should have turned around after 24 hours, went back and killed Jezebel and Ahab. Should have done that. Second of all, he had an angel visit him. He went 40 days in the strength of that, didn't ever think about it no more. The next thing that happened was God busted rocks, God sent a fire, God sent an earthquake, and God spoke to him real sweetly. And then he asked him again. He said, Elijah, what you doing here? He, no change, no change whatsoever. You know what the Lord said to him, and this is what so stirs me and what makes me so afraid of discouragement, show you how lethal it is. Y'all listening? Let me show you how lethal discouragement is. After God said to him the second or third time, what you doing here? He didn't change his tune at all. God sent an angel. God busted rocks. God sent a fire. God sent an earthquake. God spoke to him sweetly. He still didn't change. He's so discouraged, he's not changing. You know what the Lord said to him? After God did all he could do, he said, I'll tell you what you do. 
He said, on your way home, go anoint Hazael to be king and anoint Elisha to take your place. Because I can't use you anymore. And the Bible said he went and anointed Elisha, and Elisha followed him. But did you know that Elisha did double the miracles that Elijah did? His ministry and effectiveness was cut short because of that powerful discouragement on his life. And God sent another man to reap double what Elijah could have had. That's the power of discouragement. That's what you're going to face, preachers, whenever God begins to send revival, but you're going to have to quit yourselves like men and be strong. And if there's nobody there to encourage you, encourage yourself. And say, bless God, I know this is the Lord, and I may lose my congregation, but if it goes down to five, I'm still here, and I still want to move a God. Don't be discouraged. And the last thing is this, and I close. The last thing, number five, is defamation. You're going to have to face defamation. You know what preachers like more than anything else in the world besides steak and preaching? Chicken and preaching. They like to be thought well of. We like for people to speak well of us. That's Brother Kilpatrick over there at that wonderful Brownsville Assembly of God. That's Brother So-and-So over yonder in Grand Rapids at um, Second Baptist. That's Brother So-and-So out yonder in Sacramento at Bethel Assembly. And we want to be thought well of. But I want you to listen to me and I close. Friend, when revival breaks out, you're going to have to make yourself of no reputation because here's what you're going to experience. People will begin to defame you. I walked into restaurants when this thing broke out. I walked into restaurants, and I could see out of my peripheral vision people lean over and start whispering. And I didn't know whether they were saying, he's the pastor over there at that church where they're having that mighty move of God. But I also didn't know whether they were saying, there is that weird pastor over yonder, that weird church where those weird things are happening. But I went on in and ate my grits anyway. <laughs> Didn't bother me. You know why? Because, friend, we have to be willing to be made of no reputation. Jesus was made of no reputation in order to embody and encompass the move of God of his hour. <clears throat> and if they talked bad about him and if they talked bad about the prophets, and if Jesus was persecuted and mocked and ridiculed, you're going to be. And if you're more interested in reputation than you are a move of God, you will not be having revival because that one alone will knock you out of the saddle. God bless you. Hallelujah. Let's stand together. Lindell, could you lead us in the, um, the fear not, for I am with thee? Maybe. I believe, that we sing that in I believe you're here in the right place at the right time, friend. Before Lindell leads us in this, and I'm going to share for a few minutes about the work of the evangelist in the revival, and also I want to talk to you about some questions I'm sure you have on your mind. I want you to know that you're going to leave out of here, friend, and I have no hesitation saying this, no doubt in my mind. Just as I said, the Washington Post left out of here and called everyone that had come and investigated them and called them at their homes after they left the revival. For those of you that didn't hear that last night, the Washington Post was here last week and did a, a three-day extensive interview with just thousands of people. I mean, they were just everywhere. This one guy just, I couldn't believe the territory he covered with his notebook. And he went home, he interviewed people before the revival, pastors, backsliders, and all kinds of folks that were here. And he went back to Washington and waited for everybody to get back home, and then he called them all up at their house and asked them if they got what they came for. And he called me up at my office, he said, every single person got exactly what they came for and more. And so I'm going to say this to you, pastors, we're going to be praying with you, we're going to start this evening praying with you, ministers. Whether you're from China, Japan, Taiwan, Malaysia, Singapore, South Africa, England, or Ohio, God is going to meet you. There is a fresh anointing that's going to rest upon you. 
I'm speaking this into your life right now because God is not playing games, friend. He's more concerned about your area than you are. He wants to anoint you. Pastors leave out of here going, is it possible, Steve, that the anointing has come upon me? And it's not, friend. It's not whether you shake or fall. We've had people that haven't felt anything and gone back, and they've been constant revival for weeks. Why? Open. Just open, saying, Jesus, use me. How many are open? You know you're open. We're going to be praying for you, and you'll, have, you, you, you'll get prayed for, trust me, in this, these revival meetings. And as hands are laid on you, the Spirit of God is going to come over you, friend. And I believe one of the reasons that God is having us lay hands on one another is he's drawing the body of Christ together. We're having a one Catholic woman, I'll never forget her, sitting over in this section. She came to me one night. She said, I'll tell you why this revival will go, has, has gone on this long and why it will go on for a long, long time. She said, because you here, you're concerned about people. And she said, you took hands, you, lay, you took time to lay hands on my forehead and pray for me. Nobody prays for me. She said, no one cares about me. Another Mormon girl said the same thing, got saved in the revival. And she said, you guys care. You take time and pray. Well, one of the reasons we're doing that is because there's something happening. There's a powerful anointing, and God's going to touch you, friend. I know I sound like I, I know that I know I know what I'm talking about. It's because we've been here since Father's Day. We've seen some stuff, friend. We've seen some stuff. God's going to move mightily. Sing this. Lead us in this, Lindell. Hallelujah. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When you pass through the water, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When you're walking through the fire, you shall not Burn the shout, the flame kindle upon me. For I am the Lord thy God. For I am the Lord thy God. One more time, sing with me. Fear not, fear not. I have called thee by thy name. Just praise Him right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. My soul says, Yeah. Yes, yes, 
My soul says yes. Lift your voice up. Yes. Yes. My soul says yes. Remain standing just for a minute. Uh, music team, you can go down. While we're standing, I, and it's, this is good for your circulation, okay, so I'm going to have you stand just for a minute. I'd like to uh, touch on something before getting into focusing on evangelism and revival. I'd like to touch on, uh, on the subject of manifestations. And we hardly spend any time in revival talking about manifestations because that's a minor thing. I call it majoring on minors. But you'll find that most critics make manifestations a major thing. They can come into a revival meeting and watch hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people get saved. They can sit in our baptismal services and watch drug addicts testify of how they've been delivered from crack cocaine and narcotics. And they can hear about homosexuals that have been set free and, and just hear these testimonies. But if some girl or some guy is off on the left side of their pew and their right hand is twitching like that, that's all it takes. This can't be God. We've heard it, friend. And you'll hear people say, well, if it's a true revival, people would fall forward instead of falling backward. Look at me, friend. Let me tell you, every night people are prostrated on the floor getting right with God. We've had sinners fall from the pews as dead and been carried to, the, to this altar. I've had them carried. I've watched them as they carried sinners from the balcony. I'm talking about people that were unsaved, carried them under conviction. This is what Wesley and Whitfield saw. Carried them. They were so undone and so pulled apart by the Holy Spirit. They were literally carried. They lost all their physical strength and were carried to the altar and laid down prostrate on their face, and they gave their life to God down there. We've seen that stuff, friend. I love that, and it happens every night in this revival. But there's also what some people call slain in the spirit, falling under the power. You can call it, if you don't like those, call it resting in the Lord. <laughs> Sleeping in Jesus. I don't care what you call it, friend. People fall in these meetings because they can't stand up. You try, you, I have watched, this, remain standing, this is good for us, but I have watched jocks from the local football teams and basketball teams coming, you know, just hot shot snots is what we call them. I've watched them walk into this meeting with their arms crossed like this. And I have, I've had them come to this altar. I'm talking snot. Say that with me. Snot. And I'm not talking about what drips out of your nose, but they're like that, friend. They are snots. They, they are just in God's face, you know, type of people. Prove me type of people. This is God. And I have watched him. Now, he doesn't do this to everybody. But I have watched them, friend. Nobody's going to convince him. The four spiritual laws, 52 tracks, nothing is going to convince him that it's God but the power. And I remember one man right here. You figure it out. I can't figure it out. I've seen too much, friend. I can't figure it out. This guy was standing here like this with his legs cocked. Just like this, okay? You'll see him in your meetings, Pastor. Just try it. 
That's how he was looking at me. Just try it. Tall man, strong man. Just try it, preacher. And I walked up to him and barely touched his forehead. Wham! On the ground. He went, he was down on the ground and he went, and he, went, he goes. <laughs> he jumps back up and stares me down again. Just like that. It's like, that didn't happen. You didn't see it. I didn't feel it. That didn't happen. And so I touched him again. Wham! And he jumped back up with Now you could tell his countenance was changing. Something was going on. And the third time, friend, third time I touched his forehead, I don't understand it. I don't understand the anointing. I don't understand the power, but God knows every single person and what they need. The third time, wham, he's down on the ground. He starts to jerk like this. And I looked at him and said, what's God saying to you, man? He said, he wants me to stay down here. Manifestation stuff. The Bible is full of stuff. Don't look past the stuff. Don't say, well, that was just Old Testament. That was just the early church. The Bible, if you read the book of Acts, friend, it scares me as I read that book. I say, God, are we talking about the same church I'm a part of? Angels hung out with them all the time. Angels hung out with these people. It was angel sightings, angels doing this and doing that. Angels hung out with them. Where are they today, friend? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God hasn't changed. That was only 2,000 years ago. Wasn't long ago, friend. But concerning manifestations, the, probably the greatest manifestation, a man that received the greatest manifestation that most of us never even think about was the Apostle Paul. And I want you to study this for yourself sometime. But the Apostle Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus, was on his way to Damascus to kill people. God knew he did not need the four spiritual laws. He knew that he did not need a Brownsville video. God knew that Paul needed something a little on the powerful side because God had a work to do in his life and he had to do it quickly. And so he did not, the Bible does not say that a delegation went out to discuss what was about to happen with Saul of Tarsus. That the Lord sent a group of Christians alongside his camel and said, no, no, Saul, this is about in 30 minutes, you're going to see something that you've never seen before. It's going to be bright, Saul. No one explained that to him, but here he is trotting off, and I don't know if he's riding a horse, a donkey, or walking. The Bible doesn't say. But he is on his way to Damascus, and the Bible says something happened. Read it for yourself in Acts chapter 9. Saul tell, Paul tells a story uh, better than I can. It happened to him. It was personal, friend. And he said, a, a light shone from heaven, noonday, brighter than anything, he fell to the ground. I don't know if he was thrown to the ground. I don't know how it all happened, friend, but he was in the dirt, and this was not the kind of man that would do something like that. He didn't suddenly go, you know, I think I'll lie down, gentlemen. So he lies down. He was in the dirt, and then a voice came from heaven, and he started talking to it. This is strange, friend. This is not, and, and those of you that, that uh, have to have a scripture for everything, look at me. What would have happened if Saul started turning through the, new, the Old Testament going, where is this? It ain't in there. And then, not only that, he's blinded for three days. Blinded for three days. And on the third day, he's prayed for and something like scales fall from his eyes. Friend, this is heavy. Those of you that say the Holy Ghost is a perfect gentleman, wrong o sito, brother. <laughs> Saul would dispute you on that. He said, now wait just a cotton-picking minute. That was not kind. That was not sweet. That was not gentlemanly. It wasn't a handshake. It wasn't a discussion. It was wham, down, blind. Some of you in this room and other critics that walk the face of this earth, if you lived 2,000 years ago, you would have gone up to Saul of Tarsus after that experience and said, You've been deceived by the devil. Scales from your eyes. Give me a break. Here they are, 
man, look at them. I got them in my pocket. <laughs> what? I cannot believe you're so blind. You're blinded to Lucifer, that Lucifer is doing all that. You, Jesus doesn't work like that. God doesn't work like that. Some of you would have done that to Saul. Turns out he wrote most of your New Testament. You better keep your grubby hands off manifestations. You don't know what God, God is doing. You'll never know what God is doing. It is a personal thing. It is a personal thing, friend. We've had God throw people up against the wall in here. We got a banker with us today who would testify to you. It was the power that swept through his body. He came to get his wife out of the revival. Where are you at, brother? Robert, just when he's an usher now. But he came to get... <laughs> He came to get his wife out of the revival, you know, because they had money, prestige, everything. So he came to get his wife out of this cult. <laughs> Little did he know it was almost over for him. Power of God. John Kilpatrick gave him a hug right here. Gave him a hug, just hugged on him. And we didn't know who the guy was. Gave him a hug, and he said when that happened, he felt nasty come out of him. Now, this is a, these are sinners. They can talk how they want to talk. He felt nasty come out of him. And th so that scared him, so he went back to his pew. And as he was walking out, I was praying for folks in the foyer back there. And at night, we just pray with folks everywhere. Everywhere there's a little mauve carpet, whatever this is. And we were in the back praying for somebody, and he comes walking by, just reached out and shook his hand. I didn't know who he was. Wham! Up against the wall, down on the ground. For 45 minutes, friend, the Spirit of God swept through his life. He's here today. He got saved on fire for God. Listen, God knew, and his name's Robert Lowell, God knew what it would take for Robert Lowell. Are you listening? You don't know what it takes for an individual. God knows what it takes for an individual. Maybe someone who is slain under the power and falls backwards in your church and lies on the ground. Sure, there's going to be fakes. Get over it. Get over it. There's always going to be that, friend. I don't walk around. I don't walk around spying on everybody and going, hmm, that's about a nine out of a ten. That's a five. That's a one. He didn't get off zero, man. That ain't God. We're not God's marshals, friend. But we've learned. We learned how to pastor this thing, but you don't control it. Don Wilkerson, who pastored Times Square Church for so many years, he came down here. One of the things, he stood right here. He's preached in this pulpit. What blew him away about this revival, he said, you guys pastor this thing, but you don't control it. You don't have your clamps on everything. There's the, he said the Spirit of God is free to move. Free to move in this place. And he said that's why God's moving here. You don't walk around going, stop that. You, no, get up, get ushers, get her out of here. Amen, you may be seated. There he is, Robert Lowell, wave at us. Let me ask you. Did you come to this revival to get your wife out of it? Did God get your attention that night? <laughs> Are you a changed man? Hey, how long ago was that? Before um, talking a little bit about what's in your notebook, once again, those of you that have a hard time with manifestations, last night when they talked about a haze in this place, how many were here last night? They talked about a blue haze. Some of you went, uh-huh. <laughs> Friend, I am, a, I am a history buff. My only hobby is reading. My wife will tell you I've got an extensive library and a lot of my books are two and three hundred years old. The actual books are old leather books and I get a lot of them in England and Scotland and, and they're just old revival books, a lot of them. And old men and women of God, that is, I got a lot of the old journals of these guys and what they wrote about. And I've got one book from a woman who used to travel with George Whitfield in his prayer ministry team. And he, it was all, everything she writes is behind the scenes of George Whitfield's ministry. And it's powerful to see that because you never heard about that. These were the people that were praying while he was preaching. These are the people, so there's a, a lot of these books, 
have things that you can't deny, and it's, they're called manifestations. And uh, last night when Pastor was sharing what he was sharing, I just I showed Mike uh, this. Uh, how many here are from the Assemblies of God? Lift your hand up. God bless you. This, this happened in the Durham Mission to Brother Bell, part of our first executive presbytery. But he said, reported that the top third of the huge auditorium was often filled with a thick blue haze. Is anyone listening? The top huge of this huge auditorium was often filled with a blue haze. Did they start Brother Bell's Blue Haze Ministries? No, friend. But there was a blue haze. Listen, when this haze was present, people entering the church would often fall in the aisles under the power of God before they can even reach their seats. According to Brother Bell, miracles took place around the clock with hundreds receiving either the baptism or divine healing. And they say when that haze moved into the building, something happened. Now you can say, I don't believe in all that. Then sleep with it, friend. You know, but if we're going to have miracles in this nation, we better back off on this unbelief and say, Jesus, you can do anything you want. You want to know who believes God for miracles? All those teenagers you saw last night. They're uncanny. They'll come up in my face and go, God said it. You know? If I'm, oh, no, you know, I just, you know. They'll have more faith to pray for the paralyzed, the blind, and why? It's in the Word. But some of us, boy, we've been around too long. We'd rather send them to an eye doctor. Well, I'm going to push something. I never push anything at these pastors' conferences, but you're going to buy this. <laughs> I want to tell you why, and I, we never do this, friend. I could, I could really care less, but um, this just came off the press yesterday. It, from Chicago, it just came in on Delta Airlines this morning. These are the Azusa Street papers, and um, this has been redone. We published them. There was another copy out there that was ragged and tattered. This is on parchment paper, um, pictures that some of you have never seen before. I worked alongside Wayne Warner of the Archives of the Assemblies of God. The papers were gotten from an Assembly of God family, the original papers. These are copies of the original, the actual size. And so this is not a reproduction of a reproduction. We got the original papers and made copies. They're very brittle. As a matter of fact, when we pulled them out of the archives, they started falling apart again on us. That's how fragile they are. But these are the apostolic times, the apostolic faith. And it'll share with you what took place in Azusa. It's powerful because it's unedited. Uh, Brother Seymour, he was the editor of the thing, and he, get out of here. You can't. <laughs> I'll let you have it in a minute, man. I'm not finished with the advertisement. <laughs> but uh, I told you a few minutes ago, my hobby is reading. This is the type of book you can put it, I mean, it's so well done. The cover is beautiful. Pictures in here that people have never seen that we got from the archives of Brother Seymour and the group that worked at Azusa Street. But it's the type of thing that you'd sit on your coffee table. And I want to tell you, friend, it is fun to read. You'll read what was taking place as people were prayed for at Azusa and went back to India. The letters they sent back. Prayed for Azusa, went back to Taiwan or Thailand or Germany. You'll see where the power came down, friend. And all through here, you'll see stories of people were thrown to the ground, slain under the power. This happened, that happened. This man was healed. It's just, it's actual footage, if I could use that terminology, of what took place. And if any of you know anything about the Azusa Street, uh, the Azusa Street revival, it was, their mailing list is what kept the revival fires going. And the revival basically went out uh, when... When the mailing list was stolen, uh, William Seymour fell in love with this, uh, a woman there at the revival meeting that was working on staff. They got married, and a secretary got jealous and stole the mailing list, which was 25,000 names, which today would be like a million. Took those 25,000 names and left town with them, and basically the mailing stopped. You know, that was the only form of communication back then, really. And so no one got their mailings of Azusa. It was basically, people thought it was over. It was a tragic ending to what could have probably gone on for several more years. But these are, this is what the people got when they, when they got their Azusa papers. They got the Apostolic Faith newspaper. And so these right here, uh, they just arrived this morning. They're going to be on the book table. And we're running these. These are 1950 or two for 30. And what, and I would suggest... Um, because we, we have published these things. I would suggest getting some of these as gifts. You're not going to be able to buy them in any bookstores. This is the only place you're going to be able to get them. And get them, get them, friend, to read them. It's great. Because most of us that are Pentecostal have no idea about our heritage. If it wasn't for this, 
If it wasn't for these papers, it wasn't for your great, 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 great grandfather going to this place, you wouldn't be an assembly of God, you wouldn't be a Pentecostal. He made a pilgrimage. Somebody prayed for somebody and it kept on going down the road and finally your daddy got filled with the Holy Ghost and here you are. This is a history. So anyway. I relinquish my only copy. <laughs> yeah. Pastor, make the check out to Together in the Harvest Ministries. But I'm going to leave the subject of manifestations, and it really, it's something that's so, it is so silly, friend. It is so silly to even let it bother you that, that somebody's hand shakes or their, their body quivers. I look at that, and aren't we dealing with the God who can shake mountains? I mean, if he can split open the earth and swallow people, why can't he shake somebody? And uh, I have been shaken. I have been thrown through the air. I've had things happen to me, friend, that I've never happened before. I've never, I've never even believed in it because I've never really seen it. But I've had things happen to me. One particular night, uh, the Spirit of God moved in this place, and there was a strong sense of intercession. And there was two or three young people over at this side of the church on their face, and they were wailing. They were just wailing. And the ushers went and got them and started moving them out because we're moving on with the service. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me where Kerry Robinson sitting. And he said, Steve, stop them. Stop those ushers. And I got up and Charlie, who works with me all the time here at the Revival, he remembers we, we ran around the back and the ushers were not taking them out. They knew that God was doing something also. They laid them on the back steps right, right here on the side of the choir where the choir goes up. And as they laid those kids down there, I went around and I got close to them and I was jolted by electricity. I, and friend, I was thrown up in the air and thrown to the ground, picked up and thrown to the ground, went up in the air and thrown to the ground. It happened like 15, 20 times. I've never had anything so violent happen to me in my life. And it was totally out of control. I had no control. I had absolutely no control. And God was just, he was getting my attention and <laughs> he had my attention. <laughs> and I remember, when it stopped, and some of the ushers thought it was so violent, they thought some of the young people were doing something to me because it was so violent. And, uh, and, and I remember when it stopped, I turned up and, and I looked up at those kids and I turned to the ushers and I said, get them on the platform now. And so the, they took them on the platform, and for those that may remember that night, the hev heaven came down that night. People began repenting and weeping and wailing. Sinners came running to the altar. This place became a, a place of weeping and mourning and wailing, and it went on probably two or three hours. Hundreds were saved. Sinners got saved. Uh, friend, it was so awesome to see it. But it happened because of a violent encounter that I had over there, and I'm at the place now. If God can take Saul and change him in an instant, violently and if God can can translate Philip through the air 25 miles if you know anything about church geography 25 miles Philip was translated after speaking to the Ethiopian eunuch he was translated 25 miles through the air if God can do that why can't he get a hold of you amen turn in your notebooks for the next 30 or so minutes it's on page 47 in my notebook, of course, my notebook was bound wrong. The opening page on mine is the last page, and halfway through my book is the uh, front of the book. Is your book all right? Devil's messing with my head. Focusing on evangelism and revival, once again, friend, we don't have all the answers. And I'm going to go quickly through this and, and touch on the areas that the Lord speaks to me as I go through it. There has been a refreshing around the world. I thank God for it. But I don't believe God is going to refresh us without taking us on to the next step. There has got to be, friend, there has got to be an evangelistic focus in any revival meeting. If not, we will become the Dead Sea. The same people can't keep coming over and over and over again, getting the same food over. Friend, it's overindulgence. They're going to they're gonna die of overeating unless they go out there and give it out. I preached a message entitled, We'll Work for Food in this place. And I was talking not only physically, but spiritually. 
How many of our people, they come in and they sit in Sunday morning services and get a full meal from you, Pastor. Then they'll come Sunday night and, and, and get full all the way up here to where they're belching up the food. And then they'll come again on Wednesday night, but they never do anything for God. They never go out in the fields and work off that, that food. They never go out in the fields and talk to people about Jesus and then bring someone to the revival or bring someone to church. There's nothing like being in church, friend, with a sinner by your side. You've worked out in the harvest field all day long. You've been talking at work or talking at school with your friends, and now they're at the revival meeting. There's nothing like that, friend. We'll work for food. God, I want you to feed me, but I'm willing to work all through the day in, the, in your fields to get that food. So there's got to be an evangelistic focus in the revival meetings. Put your people to work. And I'm not talking, friend, about uh, give them a hand, hand of tracks and tell them to go door to door. That scares people to death. I'm going to say that again. That scares people to death. It's scary. It's the unknown. But I shared with a women's group up in Memphis, Tennessee one time. They, one, one lady stood up. She said, we're, we're the WMs. And for those of you that aren't part of the AG, that's the women's ministries of the assemblies. And she said, what can we do? And I said, how often do you do laundry? She said, I do laundry twice a week. I said, how about once a week, do it at the laundromat? Just take a load of laundry and go down to the laundromat. And you can do any laundromat in town because there's some that are in wealthy areas of town, people that are moving into town. They don't have an apartment yet. They're living in a hotel and they're doing their laundry at the laundromat. And you'll see them, they'll pull up in a Mercedes or they'll pull up in a nice car. They're not all poor, poor folks that are out there doing laundry in laundromats, but you need to reach them all, the poor and the rich. And I said, go to a laundromat and do your laundry there, and these folks just sit around. Sometimes there's a television with a soap opera on, sometimes there's just country music playing, and there's a stack of people magazines and other junk for them to read. Rather than do that, meet somebody. Meet somebody. The problem with most of our church people is they don't know sinners. They surround themselves in socials, church socials. They don't know sinners. Go to the laundromat, do your laundry once a week at a laundromat, and just meet people. Don't go there going, I got to meet somebody, I got to meet someone. Go there and just do your laundry and let the Holy Ghost do that. And someone surely will come walking in, put their laundry in, and sit down next to you. And before you know it, you're saying, Hi, how you doing? Good. You know, and you strike up a conversation. Next thing you know, they're saying, Listen, we're just moving into town, and um, I just got some questions about the schools. Well, I've lived here 15 years. I'd be glad to answer some of those questions. How about if we just set up a time to go around and look at some of the schools? Talk to them. Is anybody listening, friend? That's how you win people to Jesus. Next thing you know, you're in the car driving around town with her, driving around town and, and, and showing them the, the restaurants and, and, and where people hang out, parts of town that are dangerous, parts that aren't, and you became, you've gained a valuable friend. Why? You went to the laundromat and did your laundry. Friend, this is how it works. I've, I've never talked about this. I don't believe in this revival, but I'm talking about it right now. Men, you want to join a club? Go join a skeet shooting club. Go do something you don't even know nothing about. Go to where some heathen hang out. If you want to join a club, go do something and, and meet people. If you got some spare time, go out there and meet some folks. Encourage your men to go out there and hang out. Jesus hung out with sinners. He hung out with sinners. He got around people that, that smoked. He got around people that drank. He, got her, he hung out in the smoking court. Okay. Well, numero uno. Number one, the work of an evangelist. A, the call of an evangelist. I don't want to over-spiritualize this, friend. I do not remember the call of an evangelist. The evangel, I believe, means good news. Am I right? Friend, every one of us in this room are evangelists. Every single one that's listening to me by tape, you are an evangelist. Now, there's some that are, have, a, have an ordained calling to do a little bit more than others, but I don't believe anyone has been exempted from the call to preach the good news, period. It's in you. So I'm trying to separate your pastor. Some of you that you're just going, well, I need someone special to do this work. There's an evangelist right there, John Kilpatrick. I've watched him. We do some meetings around the country, and I watch that guy gleaning, uh, the, I mean, gleaning the fields, throwing out the sickle. He's got an evangelistic zeal in him, but he's a pastor. He's a pastor. And God has placed a measure of an evangelist in every single one of you. You have a call to the good news. I'm going to get into the meat of it in just a second. The responsibility of an evangelist. To me, it's twofold. One is this, to stir the church. To stir the church. It's number one, does, our, does the church need stirring? 
Does the church need stirring, friends? Did you know the other day one of my staff members was on the phone with George Gallup of the Gallup Poll people, and, and they're pretty um, uh, on target when it comes to... Uh, comes to surveying America and what's going on in this country. And I know those of you from other countries, you have pollsters that, that will take polls and call homes and find out what's going on, uh, even in religion in your nation. And uh, George Gallup, they did a, a poll in America just uh, not too long ago, and they called the adult Americans. And this is plus or minus 3%. And this is what they found, that 84% of adult Americans in America believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God or God himself. That means there's no debating, friend. 84%, that means only 16% don't believe in Jesus. 84% of the people in your community believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So you don't have to mess with that no more. They already believe. 80%, this is another part of the poll, 80% believe that they will stand before God Almighty on Judgment Day and be held accountable for their sins. If 80% pastors believe they're going to stand before God, then why aren't you preaching on judgment? Since they already believe it. You're afraid you're going to lose them? You'll lose them if you don't preach it. Because they know they're going to stand before God. They've already said that. I will stand before God. The problem is, friend, 84% believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but they're not living it. They're not living it. That's why I believe there's a great awakening coming to America. We're in the same condition that Jonathan Edwards found this country, the same condition George Whitfield found it, and the same condition Charles Finney found it. This country is backslidden. But they have a gut belief. So those of that come into the church... You need, and I'm going to cover the altar call in just a minute, but you need to understand, they need to be stirred. And that is the call of an evangelist. The first part is to stir the church, and the second call is to save the world. And that may sound egotistical to you, friend, but if God be your partner, make your plans large. I'm not going to settle for a million or two million. We're believing God by the year 2000 that 100 million Americans will have made their place way to an altar somewhere in America and giving their life to Christ. And if you're sitting here going, that'll never happen, I rebuke you. I rebuke you. What are you throwing water on the fire for? You're supposed to be throwing a log on it. You're supposed to be saying, what do you mean 100 million? There's 250 million people, Steve. Why can't you believe God for all of them? Well, you got more faith than I do, brother. I'm believing God for 100 million. But there's some in this place going, oh, it'll never happen. Come on, you don't know where I live. I live in downtown Indianapolis. The sin is rampant. I'm from the Bronx. I'm from here. I'm from there. You, don't, you live in an artificial world, Steve. No, friend, I've worked the streets of America. I've preached the streets of America. I've held street meetings in the streets of America. I know this nation. And uh, those of you from Guatemala, those of you from Ecuador, Argentina, Spain, Russia, I've preached there too, friend. Everybody's the same. I've watched sinners weep in the streets when they're confronted about their sin. So you're called to save the world. Those are the two calls of an evangelist. The two most important ingredients, number three, number, number C, or letter three. The two most important ingredients is personal holiness. Leonard Ravenhill, I got this quote from him. I'm tired of preachers who act like lions in the pulpit but play like kittens outside of it. Personal holiness. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. Forget it, friend. If you don't get holy, if you don't get holy, why don't you just go build cabinets or something? Get out of the ministry. Get holy. Without holiness, friend, you might as well hang up the evangelism, hang up the rest of it, friend, because you're a hypocrite. You're out there doing something you ain't supposed to be doing if you ain't holy. You are a hypocrite. You're telling somebody else to live for God, and you're not doing it. Personal holiness. You'll hear me make the statement in the revival that the Holy Spirit should be able to go into your home and go through every box, every drawer, every video cabinet. He should be able to go through your home, friend. There should be nothing hidden anywhere in your home. Your glove compartment, between your mattresses, at work. There should be nothing, there should be nothing stolen that you've stolen from work, at work, that now it's at your house. A stapler. 
something that belongs to your, your, your home, a little zip bag from the bank that, that belongs to your company, but you took it home and you just said, well, it just cost three bucks, big deal. I'll just keep it for my own finances. You're a thief. You're a thief. Holy Spirit should be able to go through your home, friend, and not find a thing. From wall to wall, from attic to basement, not find a thing. Now you're getting holy. Now you're getting holy. You're de it's coming home. You're getting personally holy. When you get that, friend, you're going to automatically, when you become like Jesus, you're going to have the next one, friend, and that's a deep burden for souls. When you become like Christ, the only thing that's going to matter to you, friend, is souls. That is what makes us tick here. I love this revival. I watch people coming to Jesus every night. I watch people getting refreshed. I watch the touch of God on their lives. But those that know me here, friend, when I see a sinner, a blatant, rank sinner coming to Jesus, my heart leaps. That's all that matters, man. Because I want to be in that, that herald of angels in heaven. I can hear them rejoicing every night as these people come. I've got a burden for souls, and it's not just here. My wife is... Is probably, she's, she's here today. Jerry, wave at me. This is probably the greatest evangelist I know, and I can't go anywhere with this woman without her taking time with people. And uh, the other day, we were at a uh, picture frame shop to get some pictures of our kids framed, and we got three children, and, and I said, I'll wait in the car, and that's a big mistake. <laughs> and she went inside, and 45 minutes later, she comes out with tears in her eyes. She said, Steve, I just couldn't help it. She said, do you know the woman in there, she's living in adultery, Steve. She's away from God. She doesn't know the Lord. And I just had to talk to her. And they spent 35, 45 minutes talking about God. I was with her one day in, in a grocery store, and we were walking by the Campbell's soup counter, you know, and I was just getting some soup, some chicken noodle, you know, some, some, uh, some junk in the, in the grocery. And, and I, heard, I heard down the aisle, this lady screams out. She goes, McDonald's! And Jerry's standing next to me. She goes, ah! Oh! And like in an old-fashioned movie, you know, they start, old, you know, slow motion. They start, they start prancing towards one another and they embrace. And I'm going, what on earth? And turns out the lady, Jerry, had gone into McDonald's to get a hamburger one day. And the lady was sitting by herself. Jerry got her Big Mac, went down and sat next to the lady. The lady wept and cried. Jerry prayed with her. She got right with God. And now this was months later. Her marriage had been restored. She was back in church, and she went, McDonald's! <laughs> Woo! A deep burden for souls. Compassion means to suffer together. i got to move on. There's some stuff here we're going to cover, and we just got a few minutes. Prepare your heart for the message. The Bible says in Isaiah 66, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. I've got a quote there, the flower of humility grows only on the grave of pride. Are you humble? How many want God to look at them? The days are gone of snotty evangelists, friend. Pastor, look at me, and evangelists, look at me. First of all, evangelists, if you are one of those, and you know what I'm talking about, just one of those, that acts like what people think an evangelist should be like, you're a stench in God's nostrils. America, you ask America about what an evangelist is, they, can, they, they paint you a picture. Snazzy this, snazzy that. Runs out of the auditorium as soon as the preaching's over with. Hops in a snazzy car, goes off to a snazzy hotel. That's what America will tell you. Big offerings, big this, big that. Money, money, money. 45 minutes on the offering, 30 minutes on the message. America will tell you what an evangelist is, and the sad thing is, it's true. Why? They're not broken. They're not humble. And pastors, if you've got an evangelist come to you and says, he's your man, back off. He needs to crawl into your church and say, pastor, I'm here to serve. I'll, I'll sweep the church. I'll do anything you want. I'll clean the toilets, pastor. If you want me to help you preach, and I'll, I'll do that, pastor, but I want you to know. I'm a broken man. I'm a humble man. I'll love on the people. I'll care about the people. Oftentimes, you'll see us in this revival, and this is not lifting us up. I've always been like this, friend. I'll be on my knees in the midst of thousands of people with a little seven-year-old kid. And I'll go, what's your name? You go, Johnny, where are you from? Wisconsin. Where in Wisconsin? And he'll tell me, I go, you like cheese? He'll go, 
I go, well, that's sad, Johnny, because you got plenty of it up there, don't you, buddy? <laughs> then I'll say, do you love Jesus? And if he has a question in his mind, I'll explain Jesus. And all these other hungry adults are standing around going, come on, come on, come on. But then you'll look at some of them just crying. These adults going, dear God, man. I've never seen anything like that. I've never seen a man loving on my child like that. I've never seen an evangelist spend five minutes with my child and, and talk to him about a call of God in his life. And friend, we're all nobodies. We're all dirt, friend. Nobody's anybody. We're all the same. You want God to look at you. Isaiah said, be humble, be poor in spirit, be a broken man. You want God to look your way. The Bible says he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He hates the proud. The Bible says resist the devil, but some of you resist God. God's resisting you, friend. Resist. Oh, man, I don't want to get on that one. But be humble. Be broken. Let me tell you something else, evangelists. If you go to a church to impress people by your oratorical abilities, you've missed God. It's one of the greatest preachers in the world right here. But there's not one iota of jealousy between he and me. We love one another. We're best of friends. I've known each other for 14 years. We, just, we you maybe see us during a meeting. We'll just joke and laugh to one another. Why? I don't want his job. He don't want my job. And besides, I'm just visiting here. <laughs> just passing through. <laughs> but he's the teacher. He's the pastor. He's the preacher here. There's only one head of the church. He's a federal headship. The evangelist works under him. And if you've got an evangelist that usurps any kind of authority, show him the door. Say, out. If a member of the congregation comes to me and says, you know, I think you have a demon. I go, you a member here? They go, yeah, and I think I got a demon. Talk to John Kilpatrick right over there. <laughs> he's a federal headship. He, he's, he takes care of demons like you. It's wonderful, friend. It's wonderful to be able to point everybody in his direction. But there's one, there's one, there's one chief and so, pastors, if you have an evangelist that gets out there and tries to, you know, undermine you and, and you find him, by the way, if you find him taking out a deacon to lunch type of thing, you know, taking out a couple members, those are warning signs. Those are warning signs, friend. He needs to let you know everything that's going on. Everything that's going on, friend. Well, I could spend all day on that. And I'm not going to. Broken in spirit. And one who trembles at my word. You do a word study on that, my friend, yourself. Let me get on this. Preaching the message to the heart. Know your congregation. People who are close to the truth. This is religion versus Christianity. The Ethiopian eunuch, look this way. The Ethiopian eunuch that Philip talked to was close to the truth. Remember, pastors, evangelists, when you're preaching in a revival meeting, there are people in that congregation that are close. And as you're preaching, you've got to remember all these kinds of people that are out there. There are people that are close to the truth. That means they're this close to getting saved. Don't drive them away. And then there are people that are distant from the truth. Those with no clue. You ever met people with no clue? They're distant from the truth. Like the Samaritan woman. Distant from the truth. Gonsville, friend, and they'll come into your meetings every night. You'll hear in this place. I'll mention things like this. Those of you that are Buddhists, the other day we had 10 Muslims saved right here. Why? Because they were distant from the truth. And in the meeting, I said, those of you that are Muslims, those of you that are Buddhists, those of you that are, that are in, in cults, those of you that are witches from New Orleans, and they come all the time to this revival, Warlocks, into witchcraft, into the psychic network. Those of you that are into other things away from God, away from Jesus Christ, I want to talk to you for a minute. And so make know who you're dealing with, friend. And by the way, just because they're dressed in a, a nice two-piece Italian suit with a silk tie, don't let that fool you, friend. You don't know. That man could have been on the psychic network for an hour before he walked into your church. He could be involved in all kinds of 
garbage from hell. So no, when saying know your congregation, the bottom line is you really can't know what's going on in everyone's heart, so you have to cover all the bases. There are people out there that are distant from the truth, and when you're preaching, you've got to remember that. One of the things I hate when I go to a revival meeting, I've been to many of them, friend, is when the evangelist tries to impress everybody with some deep theological message. And he's serving filet mignon, and it's wonderful, but there's people out there gagging. You don't take a man who's dragging himself through the desert and he's dying of thirst and lift up his head like in the old cowboy movies and shove a T-bone steak in his mouth. You take an eyedropper with a drop of water and you drop it on his tongue. You've seen the old cowboy movies where they'll take the canteen and the guy will grab it and start guzzling it and they'll jerk it away. Why? He'll choke to death. Give him a little bit of water. Let him calm down. A little bit more. Let him come around. Remember, they're out there, friend. And if you choke them with a T-bone, they're going to sit there. They're going to sit there and they'll walk right out the door. You never touch their life. Remember, these people are there. Three, people who know the truth and have fallen away. The prodigals. Pastors, we could stay here all day, but you're going to be here in the revival meetings and you're going to hear me hit on the backsliders. Backsliders are the most miserable people that ever lived. Miserable. They hate themselves. The world hates them. And the Christians hate them. As far as, and I use hatred as the fact that they're, they're betrayed. They betrayed the church. But they still call themselves Christians. And they're out there in the bars every night drinking beer. They're drinking beer in the bars, and when they get good and sodded, a conversation, oftentimes, ask any bartender, he'll tell you, religion comes up all the time in bars. And they talk about Jesus, and they'll start crying. They'll start crying. That's why D.L. Moody used to take his Sunday school class in the bars singing Christian hymns because he knew in that place was a, a bunch of backsliders sitting around. And D.L. Moody used to take his Sunday school class. And this, I love this story, friend. He used to take them in these little twerps, little bitty kids. He used to take them into bars at midnight in Chicago. And he would, he would go up to the owner of the bar and he would say, can this, these kids sing the national anthem? And the bar owner goes, sure, why not? So they start singing the national anthem and they're in harmony and the, you know, the folks are just, they're, they're drunk and they're all emotional, you know, and they start squalling and bawling and all attention on the kids. And then afterwards, you know, everybody's going, oh, oh, and they go, more, more encore. Then the kids go, amazing grace, how sweet. By that time, the bar owner can't do anything. The kids already won the whole bar. And then... He'll put one of those little kids up to testify how God's delivered him and delivered his dad from alcohol, and, and they want to see all those folks in church the next day. Well, D.L. Moody knew he was dealing with a backslidden nation. And remember that, Pastor, when you're out there preaching evangelists, you're dealing with a backslidden nation. Most of those people know there's something wrong in their lives. Most of them know that they're sinning. And if, if I could just show you, friend, in the, in the back room right there, we have a key. A lady the other day, a Christian woman, came forward, gave us a key to a, a cottage where she's had a continual affair with her boss. And she turned over the key to the cottage where she goes and she lays with her boss. She came into this church, and these people are in our churches, friend. And they're lifting their hands. They'll lift their hands on Sunday morning. And that afternoon, they'll watch an X-rated movie. And they wonder why their kids are backslidden and on drugs. Hypocrites in the fullest sense of the word. And they come into our churches, you better touch on them, evangelists. And not in a hard, cruel way, but you better tell the truth that you can go to hell with baptismal waters on your face. You can go to hell with a choir robe on. You can go, hell, go to hell with a certificate of ordination from the Assemblies of God hanging behind your desk. If you don't know Jesus and if your relationship is not fresh, and then the last point is people who have received the truth and live in victory. They're out there too, friend, that need encouraging. These are, I'm talking about preaching the message to the heart. Make sure you touch them. I'm beginning to close. Persuading the heart to respond. You'll hear us in this revival talk about the word now. I've preached a message on now, N-A-W. Say that with me, now. You know what that means in the word? Let me ask our resident theologian. Okay, Mike, would you stand? Mike, you're, you're deep in theology. You speak you know, Hebrew and Greek and all. Would you explain to this congregation what the word now means? Careful study of the Hebrew sources would indicate that it means now. 
Thank you, Mike. <laughs> it doesn't mean tomorrow. Tomorrow is a word only found in a fool's calendar, friend. Now means now. Now means now. When we pray over you, you will hear me, Dick Rubin, many of us, we will pray this, now. And the Lord is not looking down from heaven going, I wonder what he means. Does he want us, Father, does he want us to work in that man tomorrow? Does he want us to work in that man's life six months from now? No, we're going, Jesus, fresh anointing, now. It's like, oh, whew. heal him now. There is an urgency, friend. You get right with God now. And I'm going to start talking about the altar call. When you start giving an altar call, friend, you better let the people know tomorrow does not exist. I just said it. Tomorrow is a word only found in a fool's calendar. They have now. Now is all the time they have. Let them know they've got to respond now. They've got to make a decision now. Today is the day. Now is the time. This business, D.L. Moody shared a story how he preached one of his greatest messages at the tabernacle, and it was talking about coming to Jesus. At the end of it, he had Ira Sankey sing the song about the love of God, and he said this at the end. He said, congregation, I'm going to give you one week to think about this message. What will you do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? And then next Sunday, I'm going to give you the opportunity to respond to this message. That night, friend, the Chicago fire broke out and burn the city. D.L. Moody said, I would rather lose my right arm than to ever have gone through that again, and I will never again give anyone any time to think about it. He regretted that to his dying day because many people that were in that tabernacle perished in that fire. Those of you from Chicago, you know that place burned to the ground. Now, it's urgent, friend. So make the people respond and let the folks know that are not coming down the altar, they've already responded by not coming. The urgency of the hour, the need to respond publicly. Jesus gave altar calls. Do you remember when Zacchaeus was up in the tree? What did Jesus say? Hold up, Zach, I'm on my way. Get me a ladder, folks. No, friend, he said, Zacchaeus, come down. What was that? That was an altar call, friend. The woman in Luke chapter 13, the woman in the temple that was bent over, the Bible said she had bent over, I think it was something like 12 or 18 years. She was bent over in the temple. We've seen people like that. They can't stand up straight. The Bible says that Jesus called her over. Why didn't Jesus go to the poor helpless woman? Why did he call her over? Look for it in yourself in Luke 13. He called her over. Why? He's public, friend. Jesus is public. Remember the disciples? They were in the boat. He was calling his disciples. What did he say? Hold it right there, Peter, James, John, all of you guys. Hang right there. I'm coming in the boat, and I'm going to teach you right there. He said, no, follow me. He was always calling people out. It is public. The crucifixion, Jesus was not crucified behind Mount Calvary. He was crucified, friend, on top of Mount Calvary. It was public. He was publicly beaten. He was publicly whipped. He was publicly scorned. He was publicly spat upon, publicly cursed. Make sure the people respond publicly, and you're going to hear and see in this revival, friend. I don't know what the crowds are going to be like this week because this is, word gets out at this pastor's conference. There's already word out there's never any room here. So we had to put out a tent the other day. It had 2,000 people outside, 4,000 people inside, and people still left because there's just no room. So people hear about the pastor's conference. They go, dear God, man, on top of all that, there's, you know, all these pastors going to be there. So I trust that people come this week and you get to see the response of the folks. But we, friend, do not have them close their eyes and raise their hand. Now, if you do that, pastor, that's your business. But Jesus on the cross, the crucifixion was not a close your eyes, raise your hand type of thing. It was public. He was naked on that cross. Most theologians believe he was totally naked. That was public, friend. And you're asking people to sit in the quiet of their pew in the back, and they go, get real. We look at him, we say, open your eyes. If there is sin in your life, if you're away from God, if you're a backslider, if you've never known the Lord, get out of your seat and get down here now. And they come running, friend. The ushers at times have to hold them back. 
because we allow them to come only when charity begins saying run into the mercy seat. It's public, and America wants it to be public. Give it the altar call from start to finish. Prepare the net, cast the net, draw the net, repair the net. I am not, friend, a master at altar calls, but we have learned some stuff about altar calls. Know where you're going under prepare the net. You can put this if you're taking notes. Know where you're going throughout the message. Know where you're going. That's preparing the net. Every service, every message should be preparing the people for the altar call. What good is it if you're going to preach, friend, if there's going to be no change? Every message should be preparing the people for the altar call. So you'll find pastor and myself a third the way through the message. I'll say something like this. Some of you right now are convicted in your spirit and you want to get right with God. In just a minute, I'm going to give an altar call. In just a few minutes, you're going to have the opportunity to respond. So they're sitting there going, in just a few minutes, I can get right with God. You're preparing the net, friend. You haven't even thrown it yet. You're, you're weaving the net. And you're, you say things like, those of you that are watching hardcore pornographic movies, I want you to know there's always three witnesses, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He's always watching you. They're always watching you in the back bedroom. They can see you at the peep shows, and you see people's heads drop all over the congregation. But why? They've been convicted. And then I'll say something like this. But in just a minute, I'm going to give you the opportunity to respond to what we call mercy. The Lord's going to show you mercy. He will forgive you. He will wash you clean. He will cleanse you. And you'll watch the heads go back up. They'll go, wow. And I'll watch tears be wiped away. And they're just chomping at the bit, friend. Prepare the net. Is anybody listening? Amen. Friend, get them ready. Number two, cast the net. When you cast the net, when you begin giving the altar call, give it. Have you ever, those of you that are here from Florida, I love watching people cast fish. What do you call it? Is that what you call it? Cast netting? But I, man, they're so good at it. I tried to do that, friend, over and over again. I tried for two hours and couldn't get that thing untangled. But I'm watching these people. They'll spin it around and whoop, that thing just comes wide open and falls. And next thing you know, they're pulling in all these mullet. You know, it's just awesome to watch these guys, how good some of them are. And I stood on this, this uh, bridge one time and watched this old lady. I mean, this lady was, she was, she was old, friend. She was bent over like the woman in Luke 13. And she, she said, here they come, here they come. And I mean, they were a long way off, friend. This old lady, she's not going to get the net over the railing. She goes, there they are, there they are. She knew what she was doing. She knew where she was from, and she'd done it a thousand times. She goes, whoa, that thing spread wide open, and those mullet looked up and went, oh, dear God. Whoa! She pulled him in. And you know something else? She knew she was going to catch them fish. She looked at me like, where are you from, bozo? I know what I'm doing. She knew she was going to catch them. By the way, it was dinner. She had to catch them. But cast the net wide and full, friend. When you give the altar call, take some time with it. Discuss some things. Say things to the religious people that are there. Tell them, those of you that are religious, you were raised in the church. You've been around the church all your life. You can talk all day about Jesus, but you don't know him. And say you can go to hell with a choir robe on. Christianity is, religion is hanging around the cross. Christianity is getting on the cross. There's a big difference. America is hanging around the cross. They love our country. They love heaven's gates and, and what is hell's flames, heaven's gates. They, they love our dramas. The friend, they're all hanging around the cross. Everybody hung around Jesus until finally he was sick of it. He was sick of this. Give me, give me, give me, God. Give me, give me. That was all religion, friend. People are coming to your church for all the wrong reasons, Pastor. Give me, give me. They're supposed to be serving God. And they're saying, give me. And Jesus finally went, enough. Drink my blood. Eat my flesh or get out of my face. You haven't bought that version yet, have you? <laughs> but that's what he said, friend. And they all left. You know what he was saying? Quit hanging around the cross and get on the cross. 
get on the cross. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So you speak to the religious crowd. I had an 87-year-old woman get saved one night, crying her eyes out in this revival, raised in a denomination where she never, ever met God, but she was religious to the max. Communion, everything, she did it all. But she came to me, she said, is it too late for me? And I said, what are you talking about? She said, I've never, ever, ever known God. I know all about him. Make sure you cast that net wide. Then draw the net. That means, friend, pull it in quickly. Pull it in quickly. Once you've thrown the net and you've discussed all the different aspects of people's lives, begin to pull it in. Pull it in quickly. Say something like this. Charity's going to sing. Elizabeth is going to sing. Bobby's going to sing. And when Bobby begins to sing, make, make sure that every moron can understand you. An eight-year-old up to an 80-year-old can understand what you're talking about. In just a second when he begins to sing, that is your moment in history. The opportunity of a lifetime must be seized during the lifetime of the opportunity. As soon as he begins to sing, run as fast as you can. That means, friend, that, you know what you're doing? You're going, whoa, you're pulling in that net, and they'll come. Don't leave it hazy. Don't leave it hazy. Don't leave it hazy, just, you know, come when you feel like it type of thing. No, now you've got to get up and come. And then repair the net. Repairing the net, friend, is when you pull it back in, and every single night, without reservation, I've pulled that net in, and I've seen holes in it. Somebody got away. And one night, I'll never forget this, Pastor John Kilpatrick came up to me, and I had thrown the net out three times already. Hundreds were at the altar weeping and wailing. And some of the people that come at the end are blatant sinners, friend. They wait to the end of the altar call. But pastor came to me and said, Steve, I really think you need to throw it out one more time because there's some people out there that won't come because they think they've sinned so bad that God won't forgive them. And I looked at pastors, there's about 4,000 people here that night, and I thought, no. I thought this to myself. There's hundreds at the altar already. Surely we've covered that. But in obedience, because this is a man of God, I said that. There's some of you out there. Everyone look at me. You've sinned so bad. You've done something so horrible. It could be adultery. It could be murder. It could be something so wicked that you can't imagine God forgiving you. But we're going to leave this open for 60 more seconds. And you're a wretched sinner. You're so far gone. But God's opening the door for you right now if you'll come. 25 to 50 people, friend, jumped up. There was a big hole in my net. Repair your net, friend. Repair your net. Thank God the pastor came up to me and said, Steve, I see a hole, buddy. A bunch of fish just swam right out that thing. You didn't cover them, Steve. Talk to them also, the ones who believe that they've gone too far. I'm going to close with this illustration. I want you to put your notebooks out. People ask us all the time why we work the way we work. Everyone listen. Why we work the way we do. We average four to five hours of sleep a day and have since Father's Day. When I have an off day, we have one day off a week, and that's Monday. When I have an off day, I sleep four to five hours. Once your body is used to four to five hours, friend, it cannot handle anymore. Mine can't. I'll, my eyes pop open every morning at five o'clock. I get in at one, they open up at five o'clock, just automatic. Never have used an alarm. My wife's here with me. We'll tell you, I've never used an alarm. I get up and I go to my study, which we built, a, we built my offices on, we bought a 40 acre piece of property and built offices next door. And I go over to my study, get on my face before God and prepare the message for that night. Because every morning, you know, I, I came here as an evangelist with five messages. And <laughs> I used them up the first five days. So I get on my face and, 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 and go after God and get the message for that evening. And God's so, so, so gracious and he continues just pouring out his spirit and speaking to all our lives. And, and, and I feel like the pressure is off. We're not here to prove anything to anybody anyway. God, God just gives us messages. And we work, and we work, and we work, and we work. Charles Spurgeon says, work yourself to death and then pray yourself alive again. 
And we work ourselves to death, friend. People call from all over, and that's one of the first things they say. How can you do it like that? Well, friend, how can we not do it? And I want everyone to listen. I'm working for something. I'm working for one thing and one thing only. There is a day coming, and I believe it's soon, where every one of us are going to stand before God. And if you're right with God, there's going to be a judgment. And if you're not right with God, there's going to be a judgment. Everyone's going to be judged. And we're going to be judged for the deeds in our body here on this earth. We're going to be judged for our actions, the things that we did. Read it in the Word, friend. There's judgment coming. And Paul, the great apostle who was thrown down to the ground on the road to Damascus, spoke about a coronation day. He said, there's laid up for me a crown. We all believe that one day we're going to stand before God and we're going to be held accountable for what we did. And, and I'm here to tell you, friend, I'm not a theologian and I don't know what that day's going to be like. I really don't. I don't think anybody does. We can all speculate. John the Revelator saw some stuff. People seen some things. They've had visions. John wrote what he saw, but no one can really imagine. He wrote it down in layman's terms and, and the way he could best, but I don't think anybody can imagine what it's going to be like on that final day. What's it like to watch people casting their crowns before the Lord? What is that scene like? What are the cherubims and the seraphims? What's all that look like, really? What's it going to be like on that final day? What's it going to be like in heaven? But we're going to all be there one day, friend. And here's what I've determined in my heart. And I want you to just bear with me just for a couple minutes, and then we're going to close today. Steve Hill is going to stand before the Lord, and you are too. And I'm going to be held accountable for what I did in this body. And I'm determined, friend, if God on the judgment day, after judgment day, and we have the marriage supper of the Lamb, and I sit down at the table, and I look across, and there's a martyr sitting across from me at the marriage supper of the Lamb, someone who died for the faith, either in the 90s or back in the 1600s, 1500s, some little girl named Sheila, whose arms were cut off, whose toes were, were cut off, and she still did not recant her faith, and she believed in Jesus, even in excruciating pain. Maybe Sheila will be sitting across from me at the marriage supper. I want to be able to lift my eyes and look her straight in the face, and I want her to say to me, hey, buddy, we were watching. We heard all about the Brownsville revival. We were watching that, man. It was a talk of heaven. It was a talk of heaven. From coast to coast and around the world, we saw that. And I dreamed as a little girl to be able to see what you saw. But my life was taken from me when I was 13 because of my faith in Christ. I was fed to the lions. My daddy was beheaded. My mom was raped, brutally raped in front of my dad, and then she was fed to the lions. And my whole family died. And I want to be able to look at her in the face. That's one thing I want to make sure happens, friend. I don't want to bow my head and look at her and, and, and in shame have to go something like this. I was such a wimp. I lived in America. I griped about everything. I never spent time in prayer, never fought, never prayed for people, never witnessed. Had all the freedom in the world, but didn't do a thing with it. But there's another thing that's going to happen up there, friend, that I'm determined is going to be a day in heaven history. It's called Coronation Day. And I don't know what it's going to be like, but I want you to imagine in closing, we're all there. And there's a rustling in heaven as these tractor trailer rigs begin pulling up on the corridors on the streets of gold. Angels step out of the cab and begin opening up these trucks, and they're glimmering and glistening with crowns. Millions of crowns. Studded jeweled crowns, diamonds and emeralds, gorgeous crowns. And this is Coronation Day. And people are lined up for millions and millions of miles. People are just lined up. Everything is just eternity. But nothing seems to take time. It's all just wonderful. And people are beginning to receive for their works done on earth. And the Apostle Paul is called up. And everyone marvels at the size of his crown. And all the people that have gone before us are called up. And then the saints that are dying today for the cause of Christ are called up. Little widow women that prayed in revival are called up. Crowns, enormous crowns are placed on their head. 
Well, friend, I'm determined on that day to have the biggest, the most beautiful, the most ornate crown that's ever been manufactured in heaven. I don't want right now the Lord to be looking over at his stock of cardboard and say, make Steve a crown out of that cardboard because his life is worthless. Make him a paper crown and color it with color crayons. Punch a few holes in it to make it look a little elegant. That's what Steve got because he wasted his life on earth. Give him that crown. That's all he deserves. Some of you in this room need to take stock of your life. You need to take a good look at what heaven's preparing for you. And this is not an egotistical statement. I want you to listen to me through. When I stand before him and then get on my knees, because it's my turn, just like it's going to be your turn, I want to kneel before him. And I want it to be a holy hush in heaven. And I want to hear angels' wings and angel talk as they go, oh, oh, ooh. And everyone looks over to the back of that truck and off comes this crown like they've never seen before. And it's got emeralds and diamonds and jewels that we've never seen on the face of this earth. Sapphires and inlaid pearls and platinum and gold and exquisite metals that we've never imagined. And the crown is passed from the angels and it is placed in the Lord's hands. And he takes the crown and he begins moving towards my head. Could be your head, friend begins getting close and he gets close I'm gonna grab it and I'm gonna push it up and the Lord's gonna push it down and I'm gonna push it back up and he's gonna push it down and I'm gonna push it up and I'm going no Jesus I'm gonna win this one everything that you did for me you saved my soul on October 28th 1975 you delivered me from drug addiction. You set my body, my spirit, my mind free, Jesus. And Lord, all I could do all the days of my life is to work for you. And I knew that one day this moment was coming, Jesus, where I could give back to you what I did in my body on earth. Worthy as a lamb, worthy as a lamb. And I want to throw it at his feet and say, you deserve all that, Jesus. It was the very best that I had. I wanted you to have the very best. That's all I could do for you, Jesus. Think about it, friend. You're going to face that day. You'll face that day. Forgive me, theologians, if I've thrown you off a little bit. I don't know what it's going to be like. And that scares me even the more not knowing what it's going to be like. I want to make sure when I get up there, the Lord looks in my face and he says, whew, well done, Bubba. <laughs> I thought you were going to wimp out on me, man, but you didn't. You just kept on going, Trojan. And I want to look over at Peter and Paul and I want them to go. <laughs> Don't you want that, friend? I want to look over at William Seymour. I want William Seymour, the one-eyed black man from Azusa Street who fought hell for the revival. I want him to go, right on, Brother Steve. I want Wesley and Whitfield and all these greats, Charles Finney to come up and go, hoo, 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 hoo. We were watching that, man. That was awesome. Finney's going to say, I thought I saw a few people fall down in my meetings. Dear God, guys. Shoo, everybody stand. Everybody stand, Lord. Just determine in your heart, friend. Determine in your heart to have something on that day to cast at his feet. Something where you can say, Jesus, worthy, worthy as a lamb. It was for you and you alone that I worked the way I did. It's for you, Lord, and you alone. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Friend, don't be one of those. I've watched a lot of you cry during this time. Because some of you are afraid you've got some old cardboard crown up there. You're afraid of it. I want to tell you, God will burn it. He'll trash it. He'll trash it. 
Turn, change your ways, man. Quit griping and complaining about everything. He'll change. He'll go, whoop, take his name off of that one. And he'll have his angels manufacturing a beautiful crown for you, friend, to give something back to Jesus. And determine in your heart. Determine in your heart, friend. One day, one day, say the Lord tarries is coming. Say he doesn't come back for another 20, 30 years. I don't know when the Lord's coming back. All the signs seem to be pointing towards soon. I don't know when he's coming back. But say he tarries his coming to the year 2010, 2015, and just imagine with me that you're sitting in your, your home on your lazy boy and you got a grandchild on your knee and you're bouncing that little eight-year-old grandchild, nine-year-old grandchild on your knee and that grandchild turns to you and says this. Listen up, everybody. He says, Papa, would you talk to me about the great revival that swept America back in the late 90s? Would you tell me, Papa, about the 100 million Americans that were saved? Determine in your heart, friend, that you're going to be able to turn to your grandchild and go, boy, I'm glad you brought that subject up because I was right there in the middle of the front lines. Don't be one of those that hangs his head when your, your little child says that because, see, awakenings prove themselves. The awakening's gone by. People criticized all the way through them. Now they're church history. They changed a the nation. This is going to change a nation. Don't be, whether you like it or not, and don't be one of those that has a grandchild on his knee and turns and hangs his head in shame and says, I criticize that all the way through it. I was one of those that barked and screamed at everything that moved. Anytime some God was moving somewhere, I was one criticizing. I was part of the critical camp, and I missed the move of God. Don't be one of those. Be one of those that says, baby, can I tell you some stories? I was there when the congressmen started getting saved. I was there when they started praying in Washington again. I was there when they publicly announced over nationwide television that school sessions are going to be started by prayer once again. I was there. I was there in 1999 when Congress passed a law in America that no longer will women be able to abort, abort their children, that abortion was against the law in America. I was there. Be one of those, friend, with that positive, soul-winning, fanatical, dogmatic attitude that God's going to change this world and I'm going to be a part of it. Those of you from other countries, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. Japan, God's going to shake your nation. Korea, God's done a great work, but he ain't finished yet. Those of you from India, you know you're in the middle of a great awakening. I've been watching it, but you ain't seen nothing yet. China, he'll do the same. Malaysia, he'll do the same. South Africa, Australia, you're about to get hit, and you know it in Australia. God's going to sweep through your nation. Be one of those that was in the middle of the front line saying, Go, God! Go, God! Go, God! He's got fire in his eyes, brother. Can you do that? Let's close with this song right here. has fire in his eyes and a sword yes, in his hand. Yes. He's riding a white horse across this land. He has fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand. He's riding a white horse all across this land. He's calling out to you and me. Ride with me. We say yes, Lord, sing. And we say yes, Lord. Stand up and fight.
has a crown on his head He carries a scepter in his hand And he's riding the white horse Across this land He's calling out to you and me Will you ride with me? Will you ride with me? We say Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I feel the Spirit of the Lord in this place. Samura kura maio lolo maioto. Samana maiando. Just quietly for a moment, just bask and soak. In his presence, there's a warm, sunshiny presence of the Holy Ghost. I feel it on my face and neck. I just want you to soak healing in your spirit right now. Come on, lift your voices. My, feel that, friend. That's the presence of the Holy Ghost. Lift your voices, lift your voices, come on, lift your voices, oh,
When you leave the building today, I want you to walk outside when you go to the places where you're going to eat. I want you to walk out those doors. If you can, try to go out those doors. And I want you to look at that line out there. First time I ever saw a bus. First time I ever walked, first time I ever saw a bus pull up out there on the parking lot, I broke down and wept. My wife and I was sitting in Morrison's one day at the Cordova Mall, and we saw a bus out there, and it said Pensacola bound, Brownsville outpouring. And when I stepped out there and I saw all those people getting up on that bus and looking out that window, my heart broke. And the first time I ever saw lines forming outside of the church here, my heart broke. And I'll tell you why it breaks. One word, hunger. Hunger. I've never seen America so hungry. They're desperate. America today, friend, is desperate. They've tried wine, women, and song. They've tried stocks, investments. They've reaped dividends. Multiple marriages, all the sex partners they want, drugs, alcohol, they tried it all. And even in the church, the church has prostituted itself and laid with this one and that one and the other that the devil's offered. But I've never seen the church and the world so desperate for God as they are today. And when you walk out those doors, I want you to look at that line. Normally it's three or four times that. But I want you to just walk out there and I want you just to look and see the hunger. And I want to tell you something else. I want you to also get it fixated in your spirit. The same thing can happen in your church. If you'll go after God, what's happening here, friend, is not that, not that, you know, specific. God, broad-based, is going to do it all over America. If you're hungry and if you're willing... To be holy and to go after God and to preach his word and to minister to his people, the same thing can happen at your church. I want you to leave the building today, if you will, please. Even if you have to walk around, it's clear outside and it's pretty today. But I want you just to walk out there and look and see that, if you will. There's some instructions. The Lord just gave me a simple word of encouragement, and I'm impressed just to share it with you now. Some of you are so desperate to receive something from God this week, and you're you're hoping you won't miss it. You're hoping that somehow you'll, you'll get it, that, that at the right moment, the right time, you'll be there to do the right, you know, wh- whatever it is. And the Lord just spoke to me and said, when you stand in the sun, don't you get hot? When you dive in the water, don't you get wet? Just tell my people to stand in the sun and they will get hot and to dive in the water and they will get wet. When it's time to worship, worship. When it's time to hear the word, hear the word. When it's time to respond to an altar call, if it's you, respond. When it's time to get prayed for, get prayed for. Stand in the sun, dive in the water. You will get hot. You will get wet. You'll get everything God has intended for you to get. So get your eyes off it. Keep your eyes on him. And you won't even fully recognize what he does, some for days, some for weeks, some for even months, 
you'll see the fullness of what he's done. The sun is shining here. The water is deep. Get hot, get wet. The Lord will meet you. A few quick instructions for you, please. Have a motel key, room 515. Please see me. Deborah Rose, Group B. I have your badge. Cheryl has some comments. Okay, because of going over schedule today, which is not a problem, we've actually prayed that this would happen. We have prayed to God that it would happen. So what we want you to do is just real simple. We're running an hour behind right now. So everything on your schedule, just push it an hour back. Group A needs to go to lunch now. Go to the, the food tent. Group B needs to go to session. If you're in group B and you need to eat for health purposes, just feel free to go on, okay? God bless you. Please vacate as quickly as you can. Go to the food tent or to the chapel or remain in here, wherever your session is, so that we can get started on time. Thank you.